We are live. It is Thursday, September 22nd. I am Dan Nathan. You are watching Market Call. That's MKT Call. I am joined by Carter Braxtonworth of Worth Charting. It is his second, second appearance doing heavy lifting here while Guy Adami is in Sicily. So thank you, Carter Braxtonworth. Welcome, bud. Thanks for having me. And, uh, Maybe we should all be in Sicily, but uh, for now we're here. Right? You know, guy, guy is kind of live tweeting a little bit, like my view now. I love those sorts of things. That, that's not my jam, but I, I feel like it's not even Guy's jam. The fact that he's doing it is pretty cool. So it's, it's good to get a, a window through his, uh, you know, through his twisted mind here a little bit. But here today, today's market call is brought to you by our partners, FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow um and of course our production partners open exchange um carter let's get into it man it's been a crazy 24 hours um you know you and i talk about this sort of stuff a lot the, these kind of knee-jerk moves after hotly anticipated events like a fed meeting it's not just the announcement of their decision which was talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks but then it's also the press conference that comes after it and it is amazing the volatility that exists between two and 4 p.m eastern from the time we get that announcement and all the back and forth here what was your take on yesterday afternoon's price action well i think going into we know that um there was a lot of people calling for a bounce in the sense that and at one point of course it looked as though that was going to be the case the sense that cash positioning at or near record highs uh, short positioning in the futures basically very skewed and that hedge funds um at some point likely to be off sides but the truth is otherwise um the problem with thinking that it's overdone is that we've just come from a big bounce. It would be overdone if we'd been selling off January, February, March, April, May, mm -hmm. June, July, August, September, but we didn't. After the June sell-off, midpoint of the year, we rallied 20%. So much capital was drawn into the market. You have prominent strategists, technicians calling the lows, saying it's in, new bull market. And because of that, when you start to unwind a bounce like that, a 20% bounce, exactly, right, eight weeks. June 1617 to August 1617, that money that takes a lot of it to force the market up that much becomes an accelerant on the way out. Yeah. Because people are playing for a trade, they say, my God, the trade's not working, I gotta get out. And so um, there's every indication that we're going to approach the June low, and then the big question is, do we undercut it? I think. Yeah, and, and, and a big part of this is not just the equity market volatility, it's the volatility that we saw in yields, the volatility that we've seen in currencies. I mean, you know, it does remind me of other periods where a lot of people who are just focused on individual stocks or the stock market here in the U.S. in particular, if you're not focused on some of these other asset classes, and, and, and again, I mean, these are sophisticated things. They're stuff that people like you and me who've been in the markets for decades don't really understand. There's much smarter people than us or product specialists who would look at our commentary and say, well, you seem very pedestrian, but there's a lot of moving pieces at once. You know, um, as it relates to the S&P 500, you talked about that big bounce that we had in two months. We just came off, you know, six and a half percent or so. So, you know, yesterday's sell off, follow through in today's interesting Ryan Dietrich over there. Um, I don't know where he is, but he's somewhere. Um, he is a CMT because those letters exist after his name on Twitter. And that must sound uh, important. The S&P 500 is officially down 20 percent year to date in September 2022 joins 1962 74 01 02 08 as the only years to ever do that since 1950 um is this an important um data point um that you know th that we're down 20 percent on the year in September and only two other years since 1950 or those are the only years but th they don't generally go lower than here I think is the point that this tweet is trying to make so hard to know again and thinking about statistics because it's really more of a factoid right or it's yeah. more like the stock traders almanac where you have data mining and we know that you can you can get data to kind of come up with any conclusion one wants and often that's the case people find their their conclusion and then they go find the data to back yeah. it up um look those are periods that were weak uh, clearly they were all typically associated with with a fundamental backdrop was weak at, at either at the corporate level or the the country, right? Yep. Uh, GDP, goods and services. And so is there an analog here? And does it play out the same way? Uh, I'm always a little inclined not to go with that kind of thing because yeah. it, was, it was different. And uh, here we are, importantly, uh, we are now 
well past the midpoint. We've got the home stretch, so to speak. And look, the market's heavy. That's yeah. Well, well, Carter, one thing I'll just say is this. is I, Obviously, I was not born in 62, and I was not trading in 1974 as a two-year-old. But I, I have looked at 1974, and it, it really is interesting that all the things that were going on there is kind of inflation and, um, you know, the stuff with Nixon and Watergate and, you know, a war. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on. 74 seems like an interesting analog to where we are now. But 01, 02, and 08, I remember very specifically. And the thing that is very different this time than those three periods is that the Fed is doing the exact opposite of what they were doing then. They were bending over backwards in 01, 02, and 08 to uh, lower rates, weaken our currency, all of the above, right? And they're doing the exact opposite now, which is one of the reasons why, and our friend Doug Cass, he reminds me of this all the time, and he was probably around in 74, not trading in 62, that you know the only certainty is uncertainty or one, one way or another. Listen, I am fairly certain that we are gonna be lower than where we are right now in two months or so as it relates to the stock market, because there is no quick fix to the mess that we are in right now. Let me just say, one other thing, though, um, this is our friend Peter Bookwire from uh, Bleakley Advisors here, Carter, and he, in his uh, morning note on the book report, which is a great read, it's one of my first reads every morning, just so you know, people, he's been a guest here on Market Call and on On the Tape, but he's just highlighting the AAII bull to bear and, you know, just kind of how extreme the bearishness is. How do you think about this? And and I know that obviously as a pure technical analyst, when you see uh, data projected in a, a long-term chart like this 20 years out, what, what does this speak to you? It's a tough one too here too. So let's take, we just had no other inputs but this. Was that was that a reason enough? Is it reason enough to then get long? I mean, yeah, I, I don't think so. Meaning these are, here's what it is. This kind of stuff is is formulaic, right? It, it, it's objective. One could say that's the point. These are the facts and there's no way other to interpret them that the reading is extreme. But the great things in life are subjective. Yeah. That's the key, right? And so what makes a drunken miller change his mind? He's not looking at something formulaic like that. Or the the or who is this baseball player who's running up on 60 home runs, right? Judge, Eric, well, that ball Judge, was yeah. clearly high and outside when you swung and hit a homer. Why'd you do that? You could have let it go by and it was a ball. You know what? That was my judgment. I think I could get that one. It's yeah. all about judgment and subjectivity. These things that are formulaic, they leave you restricted. Um, yeah. I gotta wait for this reading. It okay? It's overbought. It's sixty nine. Should I wait for the seventy reading on the RSI? I mean, come on. What is all that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, and I'll just say this for someone who's been you know trading markets and staring at fact set machines for for twenty five years every day that the market is open. I mean, for me, I, I think of all this data as inputs into a, like a broader mosaic, right? And so ultimately, it's some pattern recognition. And it's, it's some of the stuff just that you're kind of you you know you're inclined to be thinking. And sometimes that just confirms your thought process. Sometimes it challenges it. But I use technicals the same way as I think about sentiment, as the same way I think about fundamentals. And, you know, kind of they don't all have equal kind of significance in my thought process, but they are important to me. And one of the reasons why I think we, we go out of our way to highlight a lot of different methodologies um, on market call and these inputs day to day, they change and they are subjective. And like you said, some of the best things in life are subjective. All right. Here's one thing that you do really well that is not particularly particularly subjective. Um, when you think about, rel you know, we've talked about with our audience a little bit too, the importance when you show some of these relative strength charts, right? And you had a note yesterday on worth charting, and you're thinking a little differently about the relationship between the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. You had a really good call when you were highlighting this, I think a few months ago. Talk to us a little bit about your thought process. Walk us through this note here a little bit. Right, so uh, we'll get to the note in a second, but just starting with this chart since it's up and we're looking at it, two colors, very straightforward, two lines, and what, of course, it is, and you see it there, it's the NASDAQ 100, which completed 13 consecutive years up in a row. No index ever done that. And it's now down this year versus the S&P. Basically, almost a double of the performance. Now, those are two comparative lines that are absolute. Relative strength or ratio charts depict the circumstance a different way. So now we're simply looking at that same chart on the top of the, the NASDAQ 100 all by itself, but the bottom line is the ratio. It's one divided by the other. And what is so remarkable, right, is that the ratio, the relative strength line, has touched that uptrend line to the penny over and over and over. And, and the note to clients yesterday was, look, in May, the second to most current blue arrow, we said that we think it bounces. 
And you know, it got a really good bounce, outperformed the S&P. But what we think now is it's going to break trend for the first time in essentially 15 years. So let's zero in on that bottom panel and look at a chart that's just the bottom panel. You'll see it here on the next. So now there it is. This is the ratio chart. And we had that bounce in May. You can see it. But the way the big names act, Microsoft right, and, and Google and, and other key marquee names are thinking is this will break trend for the first time and effectively well, and, and what's really important, <clears throat> when you were on, I think on Monday, we had that um, grouping of charts. You had done uh, dozens of charts, I think, on Worth Charting, but we kind of picked out um, a handful of them. We started with some of the mega cap tech ones because you highlighted Google and Microsoft that seemed to be right about ready to break, and they did break over the last couple of days. Um, so they broke that June low, and they were um, you know, leading, I think, the NASDAQ to the downside. And I think that's a really important distinction that you're making right now, is that back in May, you thought it would hold and it did it had a big rally off of those June lows I think it was up you know close to 25% or so but now here being led by a couple of the largest names in the stock market and we talked about it a little bit yesterday in the market call Carter that um you know, if Apple were to play catch up to the downside, right, and Amazon, both of those are 20% off of their lows. They're about $4 trillion in market cap. And Microsoft, you know, Amazon or Microsoft um, and uh, Google and let's throw it, NVIDIA and Meta. And, you know, if Tesla were to join the party, then you have a NASDAQ that's going to go from that relative outperformance to underperformance. That's your thought process right here? That's the thought process. And we're seeing it. So because remember, when we look at an index, the index doesn't exist. I mean, it exists on paper, but the yeah. constituents are what are bought and sold. Yes, you could say that's not true, Carl. I buy the QQQs and big funds buy the NASDAQ 100 futures. But what really is happening, right? There are 100 stocks that the entire investment community, both institutional and retail, personal and professional, are all making judgments on. And money moves in and out of these stocks as it sees opportunity or risk. And ultimately, that's what affects the, the aggregate. And the big names are at risk of breaking, at least to my eye, uh, by my work. And so by inference, uh, the NASDAQ 100 is likely to continue to underperform the S&P and ultimately break trend. All right, let's take a look here at the S&P 500, because again, those same names that we talked about, um, I think the top 10 names in the S&P make up nearly 30% of the weight, but we know those top five names make up, you know, a little more than 20 with Apple above 7% here. Um, you know, this red line, this is our chart, not yours. It looks like yours, but this is my dumb lines here, but that's your line. I'm just ripping you off. You you were all over that um, as we were in the lead up to that August high here. And here we are now, you know, Carl. I, I don't know. Do you find that kind of late July low or mid July low interesting? You see that little kind of support range from the June lows to that July low. Is, is are we likely to kind of pause a little bit here? I mean, you and I are both in the new lows camp, but they don't always go in a straight line here. Would it make sense to find some support near term? Yeah, right. So it is fairly straight down. Or if you just look at the sequence since the August 16th high, after that initial swoosh down of four, five, six sessions, you get a little counter trend, a little bounce. Then you swoosh down again, then you get a major uh, bounce. And now here's the next swoosh. Does it have to bounce here day to day? It's a getting overdone day to day. But the important thing again is the index itself is not what's moving. It's NVIDIA, which is below its July low, right? And yep. it's, it's Meta, which is below, and Microsoft, which is below, and Google, which is below. And so as the constituents get worse, invariably or almost could say inevitably or mathematically the index gets worse yeah Re really quickly looking at the ndx i mean optically the charts look the same you've made this point in market call many times over the last few weeks here is that you know for the S&P to get back to its pre-pandemic highs of 34.30, we're not so far away. We're at 37.60 or something like that right there. You know, that's another, what, what do you want to call it, 10% or so. We can do that math. The NASDAQ, or the NASDAQ 100 is, is clearly a bit further away from that. That speaks to that relative strength that you talked about over that long period of time. And so I just wonder in a, a higher rate environment for longer, and we know the names that are going to be hardest hit, right, or so some of these higher growth, high valuation um, tech stock, are we likely to see, I mean, how bad would things have to get for the NASDAQ to go back and retest the NASDAQ 100, those pre-pandemic highs, Carter? Well, I mean, you're talking about a meaningful drop from here and yep. what 
what that would have to be is the second shoe to drop, which is to say we know we've had the multiple compression, but then you'd have to start to see some real earnings misses. And that's what's actually starting to happen. I mean, every day you see another one, um, Accenture today, uh, FactSet. Yeah. Got their report out. But FedEx, the point is that that's what comes next more often than not because the market is ahead of it. Prices are ahead of it. They're worried about earnings misses. And so the stocks sell off, even though the earnings are, quote, still intact. The analysts are still holding up their price targets. And then the facts come out. It turns out that the market was discounting the negative facts. And then at some point, you get to an oversold or you get to, to a, a bear market low. But it just, we're not there in the cycle yet. And so if and as, just when you're saying there's more to go, my goodness, it's a lot more just to get back to the, the pre- uh, yeah, well, that that NDX I'm sure we get down that far because that's a that's a long way. Yeah, no, and that and that's important. There's two things I want to tease out right here. So that's about 18 percent away. We just said the you know the S and P is about 10 percent away. And one of the big points that you just make about these misses and like we haven't really seen big misses. We haven't seen a Microsoft or a Google miss on anything other than currency. We've heard them talk about that demand has been okay. And so I think that's the next piece of the puzzle. I think another thing that we've seen with a lot of these misses is that we've seen companies cutting headcount. And we also know that the Fed is very focused on cooling out the economy a little bit. And the last piece of that puzzle is going to be the unemployment rate ticking up. And if you think about some of the largest names in the stock market, these big tech stocks, okay, a bunch of them sell licenses to software, right? And then a bunch of them also um, get a large part of their profits from cloud computing. And so if you think about lower headcount, higher unemployment, there's going to be enterprise, there's going to be pressure on those businesses and those services. And so to me, I think that's going to be something that we hear of about in October. And that's one of the reasons why I think to your point, the NASDAQ plays um, a little catch up to the downside. You also mentioned something, Carter, I think is really interesting. Stocks, though, that are getting near those pre-pandemic lows. We were talking about the pre-pandemic highs, or so the, the the pandemic lows, excuse me, in the March of 2020 period. And Bespoke had a note out about Adobe, um, and, and it's added to the growing list of stocks below their lows of the COVID crash. And I think this is really interesting. Talk to me a little bit about the psychology, or at least the technicals of some of these stocks that have not only gotten back to the pre-pandemic highs, which we just said, the indexes are still above, right? But they're actually gotten back to the crash levels and we remember the s p sold off 35 percent from february 2020 to late march of 2020 before it started to rebound right and so these are all reference points on the way down right it's almost like a patient and you're saying well goodness this has just happened my gosh that's getting worse and and, and you monitor the vital statistics and so to speak the, the temptation always I, at least i can speak for myself is to say well this is this is the time it's quote cheap but you know cheap is is a four-letter word it's it's a very dangerous thing there's one of the great idioms or adages in all markets up there with don't fight the fed or catch the falling knife it's called value trap are they cheap what does that mean it's it, it's not random that ford trades at a p of two or three at certain times that major brokerage firms trade at three and four times because there is no such thing as cheap until truly no one wants to buy it and there are yeah. still people interested in buying Adobe, even here. Yeah, so it's interesting because again, a name in the in the SaaS space is Salesforce.com, and and overnight, I mean, the stock's up one and a half percent today. It was up three percent. We were talking about it in Fast Money last night. There was a headline that came out that the company, ready for this one, Carter? They got and listen. I, I like this company. I like their management. I like their products. I like their business model. I've never really loved the valuation. The valuation has come in um, a bit. It's a bit of a roll up too. They keep buying companies, and 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 that roll up point is really important. But last night they guided. You ready for this? Fiscal year 2026, okay, revenue to $50 billion. And some guys and gals are on their machines after the close and they're bidding the stock up. Maybe they're short and they're covering it and they think that that fiscal 2026 revenue guidance is important to their current short position or whatever. I think that's like bizarre um, of a headline. The consensus, just so you know, was 47 billion. So you can do the math on how significant of an upgrade that was to that long-term guidance. Thoughts on like the near-term price action of that. And when you look at this thing, this stock is down 50% from its highs. It's down 40% on its years. It just fell off the chart, right, to the bottom right here. And then if you look at the longer-term chart here, you see 
that, you know, there's just an air pocket, Carter, down. And again, I'm going to those pandemic crash lows. Thoughts on this one here? It's, it's, it's the challenge of, of deciding when to go in. For instance, if we went back to the short-term chart first and then we can work backwards. We know that when it rallied, it failed to the penny, 100-day moving average. And now it's hovering at those lows and one could say, yeah, but it's not breaking. But what about that pattern here and now? And the trick is to remove CRM from it if you didn't know what it was. Software, yeah. sneakers, sushi. Why would one buy that pattern? You wouldn't. You'd be like, let's wait a little bit. Let's see if it bottom. It's just there's no reason to commit capital to stocks in, in, in pronounced established downtrend. Yeah. Now, well, you and I are going to talk a little bit about Nike. You warned me from buying it at 105 last week. I bought a little at 98.65. They report next week, and I think that's a chart that you do not like. And we're going to preview that before earnings. But I pl I plan to buy it at 92, at 88, at 84. I don't see much risk, you know, like below that, to be honest with you. But I'm just trying to kind of nibble at some stocks here, and I think regular listeners and viewers of Market Call have kind of gotten that trend by me, and have also uh, kind of leaned into the QQQs here and there on a tactical basis to kind of hedge um, those stocks. Not that the Nasdaq or the, the Nike is particularly tied to the Nasdaq by any means, but in some ways, from a valuation perspective, it has some of the same characteristics. All right, let's talk about rates here because you've done some really good work here. Um, you know, we, we don't really re need to recap kind of what the Fed said. I think, I again, I think a lot of, um, you know, market participants, economists, strategists kind of had the walk, the, 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 you know, walked away with a more hawkish sense that they're going to do 75 basis points in the November 2nd meeting and another 50 um, in the December meeting here. You know, the move in rates, though, today, Carter, yesterday, the 10 year was kind of subdued. It really didn't do a whole heck of a lot. But yields are ripping today in the 10-year. My friend Brian Kelly, and he's going to focus on this on Fast Money today at 5 o'clock on CNBC. He really obviously places this in the hand of the BOJ intervention. Talk to us on yields here, because this is a big breakout in the 10-year. Yeah, and so in that sense, while you're kind of saying it hasn't been good work on my part, on our part, in the sense that the case was made uh, that we would stop here, right? that we would not break out. And we have. And so that... That is, that is a problem. If you've got the TLT on the long side, I would take measures. The real question is how high? And I think you, you can see that the guesses, because that's all it is, right, from Wall Street are all over the map. Some people are saying four, and even as high as five. But what we do know is that on a technical setup, it has returned to a former high, mm -hmm. right, that former high being exactly the middle of June, from which it dropped from 3.5 to 2.5, which launched the S&P up 18 90%, and now it has exceeded those June highs which is, of course, the reciprocal putting pressure on the S&P. And there's every indication that having just cleared a former high, you continue to move above it. So rates higher, it looks like to me. All right. So uh, again, and, and I, you know, when I say you, you know, you've done good work, I, you know, for me, um, I, there's not one call that that kind of encapsulates you know, kind of your view on rates or so. I think your technicals have been a really good guide to me. And again, did we break down here? Yeah. Did you expect it to hold? Sure. Um, my point is, I, I kind of want to look the other way, even though that it broke, um, you know, the TLT to the downside right there. And you know, one thought I had, I bought some of the GOVT um, yesterday, and I'm thinking about this trade as a contrarian long in the TLT. So I want to focus on that kind of 20 year time frame to me i think that's going to be reflective of growth expectations and i think that's the next shoe to drop here is that all of these hikes and all of the QT um, are working their way into the system. We're seeing housing rollover. We're going to see unemployment, in my opinion, tick up here. And then you're going to see that 10-year yield moderate. And how I want to play that? Well, I want to play it long through the TLT. I want to define my risk because I'm being contrarian here. I'm looking at implied volatility versus historical. Implied is the price of options on the blue line here versus the white line, which is the historical, how much it's been moving on a 30 day basis here. And that spread looks very reasonable to me. I mean, I think vols here at, you know, kind of just below 22 are cheap ish. They were much cheaper a year ago. But again, um, if this is how I want to express this view and define my risk, um, I wanted to do it through a call spread here. So TLT today was trading around 105 and a half. I could look out to November expiration catching that next um, Fed meeting. And that might be the one where they say we're doing 75 and take a step back here. I want to buy the November one. 
108, 118 call spread cost about $2 by one of the November uh, 108 calls for about $2.50, selling one of the November uh, 118 calls at about 50 cents. So my max um, uh, premium that I'm paying here is $2. That's my max loss. Um, my profits up to $8 between 110 and 118 with a max gain of eight above 118 and losses of up to two between 108 and 110 with a max loss of two below 108. This trade risks about 2% of the ETF price. I have a break even up about 5% it is targeting again that November 2nd FOMC meeting, which would basically be like a year to the date where they started taking inflation seriously. And that might be just enough if they get Fed funds back towards 4% or so. So again, I want to be contrarian. I'm going to look to kind of define my risk, but I also want to use a mental stop on this thing if it continues to go down and this put spread, or excuse me, this call spread is about 50% of the premium I paid. I'm going to look to cut it and cut my losses there. And then the inverse, if it's a double, I would look to take half off here. Thoughts on being contrarian. Again, let's think away from the technicals a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I was, and I'm just saying it's obviously now wrong. The question is, each day is new. Can we be contrarian? New. The thing that I'll tell you just personally is most tempting to me is buying, you've got 12 year paper, I mean 12 months, excuse me, one year paper that's 4.1%. percent i not gonna say that's the stupidest thing you can do because they're gonna keep hiking. But yeah. we're getting to the point where the X and Y meet, just to your point, where they're, they're, yeah. they start to reverse. And being able to book, and that's a question for the equity market. If, if and as these rates continue a little bit higher, longer term, bigger sovereign wealth funds and, and big pension plans, being able to, when they have to get that 7% return no matter what, being able to book you know, 4.1, 4.2 on the short, and then you know, uh, high, uh, high threes on the 10-year, that's gonna draw money away from the equity market. Well, I'll tell you this, if you were watching uh, Fast Money last night, Karen Feinerman bought one year paper with a 4% nice. yield, um, mm -hmm. and she had never done that before, which I thought was pretty interesting. All right, real quickly, we got two things before we get out of here. Let's talk about Costco. They're reporting after the close tonight. You know, this is a stock that, again, has always traded at some crazy multiple at a huge premium to many of its peers in the retail space. I'd love you to take a quick technical look at this one, and then I just might have some thoughts on what the options market is pricing for this one. Right, so one heck of a topping formation. Uh, you can see it there, and I want to say, yeah, you drew the lines the way you want to draw them. They kind of draw themselves, though. That is what is known as a reversal, head and shoulders top. Uh, let's uh, look at another iteration which is taking it back even longer term, which you know it's been a heck of a thing. You're talking about only, forget about from 09 low, but 100 to 600. And then if we were to simply put a trend line in, uh, final rendering, you see here that, you know, why can't it just go back to the uh, lows of COVID, which would put you essentially where the trend line comes into play in the future. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me because that, that technical setup looks less than good. And when you think about some of the things that we've heard about inflation, whether it be food, whether it be income costs, whether it just be like supply chains and inventory, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I'm just really hard pressed to think that, um, you know, these guys are not going to benefit maybe from a consumer that's trading down a little bit. That's what Walmart told us. But I think all those other pressures um, might be a bit of an issue. The options market is pricing about a four and a half percent move in either direction. This stock generally doesn't move that much so it's not a great name to kind of trade into earnings but if they were to miss and guide down and the and the reactions kind of muted i mean this one what what's your target to the downside i mean that neckline is somewhere down 450 ish yeah i mean it's so hard to know does it have to get right to that trend line but yeah. i guess the target is low yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much for that one. All right. Lastly, and I know this is one that you don't place a lot of emphasis on, but you know, all the strategists out there, right. Who come up with these S and P 12 month targets or so our friend, John Butters at fact set, he is the uh, senior earnings, um, analyst he writes the earnings uh, insight blog it comes out every friday morning we get a quick preview of that and we kind of hit it on market call on thursdays he's saying the bottom up target for the s p 500 is 4730 based on that target industry analysts believe the index will see a near 23 percent increase in 12 months versus yesterday's close of 3855 that must have been um a day or so ago um thoughts on this here a little bit because to me again this is a moving target 
it. And I do think it's interesting to track this data. This is one of the reasons why I've read um, Butter's note for years and years and years, because again, a lot of people are staring at the same stuff. I at least like to know what they're staring at. Is it unlikely that the stock market could be up 23% um, in a year? No, it's not unlikely at all. I mean, uh, you know, again, we're down 20, 21% in the S&P 500 right now. So to me, you know, getting back a little bit above where we were, you know, late last year, sure, fine, whatever. I just don't think the environment is conducive that, again, where the dollar is, where rates are, where the Fed's position, how low unemployment is, how hot the, the, the uh, housing market still is, and how expensive stocks are. Right. So, you know, a phrase that comes to mind when I see this kind of thing, or maybe so, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Well, again, I mean, to me, what I think is important is that Butters is putting out these data points and really helping us um, think about where consensus is on this sort of stuff. And for me, I just think, again, it's just another input into my broader mosaic of how I think about trading and how I think about investing. So thank you, John Butters. All right, thanks to FactSet. They are our premier partner of Market Call. And thanks to Open Exchange for bringing it to you. And of course, Carter Braxton, thanks for joining us and thanks for all the fine work that you do over there at Worth Charting. Nothing slick, just charts. Check it out, people. I check it out every morning. It's one of my first reads. So thank you very much, Carter, for doing all this heavy lifting. Well, the guy was long, uh, gone long. He's probably long a little bit, too. He's long Sicily. Um, we'll see you on Monday, bud. Have a great weekend. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks.